edition of Marketing Unleashed. This is a show I have been excited for all week. I have just been uh, a, a Twitter. We're not on Twitter. Yes, we are on Twitter. But <laughs> are we, on uh, Twitter? we are. We are on the, the vestiges of uh, Periscope. But as always, thank you guys so much for joining us. We want to make this all about you. So as we're going along today, make sure you're asking your questions so Steve can, we can pick his brain as much as possible. And also, if you're going along, you're like, hey, listen, I know I've been thinking about having a store. I've been thinking about doing e-commerce. And my friend, they have been thinking about it too. Feel free to at mention them down below because we want to draw them as many people into this conversation as possible. Make it all about you. So feel free to do that. And also share it among all the socials. Just sprinkle it out, all the love across the interwebs. We would super appreciate that. And we've already got people stopping in. We've got Rocky saying, hello, hello, Rocky. Uh, good to see you. This is going to be a fun show. Very fun show. Mm -hmm. So, Lisa, how have you been? Take yes. it away. Yes, I've been good. I've also been very excited about this show this week. I, I we're a little later in the day um, because Steve Chu is here. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. If you don't know Steve Chu, well, you need to. <laughs> so Steve has two seven-figure businesses, uh, Bumblebee Linens and My Wife Quit Her Job dot com. My wife quit her job dot com. Um, that podcast is amazing. amazing. I've been listening it to it for years. So if you if you're thinking about e-commerce and you're not listening to it yet, you need to. Um, so I, I don't know about you, Jeff and Steve, but me and the UPS guy are like on a first name basis. I know. Now. <laughs> <laughs> they they make me happy when I see door, them in the driveway. It's like, wow, where did this all come from? So. Uh, I, I know I'm not the only one. And the reason why I know is because uh, in the U.S. alone, e-commerce grew 32% in 2020. 32%. Yeah. It is crazy. because we couldn't leave the so, house. I know. <laughs> I know, right? But I don't think this is going to all go back to we're all going out to the store, right? It's, it's probably a trend that's going to stick around a while. So if you've been thinking, I want to get in on that, uh, I want to make a change. Well, Steve is here to help with that. Um, he is the creator of the Prof Profitable Online Store course, and he's been featured in Wall Street Journal, Forbes, New York Times, on and on and on. And today, of course, the pinnacle of his success is being on our, our show, Marketing show. Unleashed. Well, I've been waiting for this opportunity for a very long time. <laughs> I know you have. Take long to ask. Yes. You, know you have. You went on ABC just so you could come on our show. Um, and you can, Steve, what's the best link for people to find you? Uh, just my wife quit her job dot com is the okay. easiest way to find me. Yeah. Great, because they always they all want to find out about you now. Yeah. And by the way, so I will clear. say. Oh, go ahead, that I know mm -hmm. e-commerce is taking over because my mom does not go to the grocery store anymore. She now really? buys all of her groceries online, and before it was not like that, and she was not a believer. But the pandemic. Do you changed think? She, her, so. Do you think that she will she will continue to buy online like that? Even well, if she, she has. feels safe, she has the vaccine. She so has. She can go now, but it's her permanent lifestyle change now. I, I agree with my parents too. I mean, they're going, they're, they stole my Sam's card and they go and they buy <laughs> bulk toilet paper and all sorts of things. So yeah, they have Hopefully like two UPS trucks going up to their, their house. Yeah. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> so by the way, before we get started, yeah. we want to make sure, and we mentioned this last week, but if you guys haven't checked this out, make sure you go to bit.ly forward slash TW Pinterest toolkit, all lowercase, all smashed together. Uh, we've got some brand new April, um, templates that you can check out they're they're really really cool but they're also mm -hmm. available on canva i mean tailwind create they're also canva but tailwind create <laughs> where you can go check those out because they are amazing you want to make sure you go there so bit.ly forward slash tw pinterest toolkit and also i want you to talk about this this new um url this sales from pinterest oh. what is this that we are promoting today this is a webinar that i actually completely redid for Steve's group. And he wanted a webinar about using Pinterest specifically for e-commerce. We had one, but it was old and really outdated. So I went real deep on catalogs and how to use all of the cool features of Pinterest to sell more for your business. Awesome. So that's at sales, yeah. bit.ly forward slash sales from Pinterest. That's all lowercase, mm -hmm. all smashed together. So make sure to check that out. All right. I didn't this, think you did it justice, Elisa. It was very comprehensive. And in fact, oh. uh, we went over time, if you remember, because there was so oh, much content. Right. There. 
and I couldn't Sorry, stop just, talking. Yeah. She is <laughs> very you. in depth. I mean, she makes your brain yes. melt a little bit every time you talk with her. So, yes. So it's a great uh, webinar. So make sure you check that out. Excited. Yeah. All right. So we're going right. to talk right before we get started. Real dive in. I want to talk to you guys real quick about mm -hmm. this new news that came out. I don't know if you've heard, but like Elise and I have teased about social audio. And Steve, I know you know about Clubhouse and everything. And well, Facebook last week in the news has really talked about the all these new um, tests that they're doing and they're going to roll out their Clubhouse clone. They're doing all sorts of things uh, like Elise is excited about the LinkedIn version. There's going to be one. Reddit just launched one. I mean, everybody's getting into social audio. Well, another one that they have rolled out that Facebook's R&D uh, platform has rolled out this thing called Hotline, and it's kind of a mashup of Clubhouse and Instagram Live. You can have your camera. Elisa and I tested it the other day, and in fact, we are actually going to go after this show. So at uh, th would be three thirty Central Time, we're going to go into Hotline. I somehow Facebook allowed me into this. They never let me have anything. <laughs> And I, I got ways. in this. And so we're going to test it after the show. If you'd like to join and continue the conversation, go to hotline.co forward slash Jeff C, which you have there on the screen. Uh, so that's the news, but that's it. We're going to jump right in now to Steve and all his e-commerce wisdom. So I know you have a question right off the bat, Elisa. I do. I do. Um, I have a question about Bumblebee Linens. So... Mm -hmm. This is the company that you and your wife, and I think it's funny, I had to do some digging to find out what your wife's name was because it was always just my wife. But now I know her name is Jennifer. Um, yep. So <laughs> She likes to scan the down low, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I read that too. She's a little bit shy. Uh, okay. She doesn't like to admit that she's married to me. You know how it is. So. <laughs> I have the same problem. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> but, okay, so... so she, she she started. You both started this this bumblebee linens company. Like, what led to that? What made you wake up and decide to do that? Well, realistically, uh, when we got married, when she became pregnant with our first child, she said, "I'm just staying at home," and mm. uh, and not even live in Silicon Valley, right? It's really expensive here. Really expensive mm. where we live. So, in order to get a good house in a good school district, pretty much need two incomes. And so, at the time, she was working for a Fortune 500 company. And she was making six figures. And all of a sudden, she told me she was going to quit, which I supported, mainly because I didn't see my parents that much growing up. So I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure that you know the parents were around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we basically thought about a whole bunch of different ways to make money. And then we stumbled upon e-commerce and specifically handkerchiefs because – when uh, my wife and I got married, she knew she was going to cry, and we actually looked all over the place for hankies. Couldn't find any. She was going to cry because she was happy, Jeff. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, Thank you. And then That's finally, fun. we found this factory in China, and then we only used maybe six of them, even though we bought a couple hundred. And then we, at that time, we sold all the rest on eBay, and they sold really like hotcakes. And so later on, when she became pregnant, we got back in touch with that vendor, made a large purchase, and decided to open a store. So, so how long have you had uh, the the store? I mean, how many years have you been doing it? Yeah, that was that was two thousand seven, and we knew we were onto something because we made six figures in profit in our first year, which basically replaced her salary, and it's grown in the double and triple digits ever since then. And today, it's a seven figure business. Wow. So, what do you oh what when somebody says, "Okay, Steve, I, I get what you're saying. You guys, you guys hit, got it while the you know struck while the iron was hot. Is it too late for somebody?" in today's economy, in today's world, to start from scratch and do an e-commerce store? Now is actually the good time because everything is transitioning over to e-commerce. Now, ironically, is probably one of the best times to do it because everyone is shopping online. I can't remember what the stats were, but I think uh, e-commerce was something like 15% of uh, overall sales, yes. and now it's it jumped to like 18 or 19%. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, what, what's also nice about now is that the barriers to entry are much lower too. Back when we got started, I literally had to code up my own site and everything. <laughs> Today, there's a whole bunch of services out there that'll just do it for you, even for free right now. Wow. So oh, that's, that's amazing. Cool. So, so Steve, did you and Jennifer have this huge nest egg that you invested all in your linens business? No, we invested six hundred and thirty dollars. Actually, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and, and most of that was not inventory. Actually, inventory was only like a couple hundred bucks at the time. Um, mainly because the minimum orders were so small, we literally got back in touch with that vendor and just made a small test order. Really, is what it was. 
Awesome. And, uh, yeah. So um, let's say, okay, you convinced me, Steve. I've listened to your podcast for years like Elisa, but I'm actually going to do something. I'm not just going to listen to it like Elisa. Does. <laughs> I'm going to start a store. Uh, so do, can I do this like as a side hustle? Um, can I like, can I do it as, and still like, I'm sure you don't recommend people like quit their job and here, you know, put up a Shopify no. site and there you go. So, but can I, I mean, how many hours a week do you have to like, I mean, I, I'm sure it depends on the niche, but is it possible to do it as a side business too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we did it as a side business. I was a director of engineering and my wife was a, uh, you know, financial analyst and uh, mm -hmm. you can definitely get by. I would say the minimum that you should devote honestly is probably like five hours a week. Mm. And in response to your other question, in terms of doing this as a side hustle, there's actually many different e-commerce business models. So if you don't have a budget at all, meaning you, you don't have enough money to invest or a lot of money to invest, there's drop shipping or like even an affiliate mm -hmm. store model. Uh, if you guys don't know what that is, an affiliate store model is basically when you refer business to another company and you get a cut of the sale. Drop shipping is when you take orders and someone else like your supplier actually is responsible for fulfillment. Uh, but the business models that I actually recommend typically are private labeling. This is mm -hmm. where you actually go and you make your own product, put your own brand on it, and you make it your own. Because when you own that product and the brand, that has the longest term potential for an e-commerce store. But of course, it takes more money. So where something like dropshipping and if the affiliate model, you can start for free, literally. Private label will typically cost you, I would say, at least $2,000 to get started with your initial inventory on average. So I just want to, mm -hmm. I want to kind of go back to this, this private label thing. Cause I've heard about it. You know, I, I've, I've done software where you white label, you pay extra so you can use the software and it doesn't have their logo on it or whatever. So let's say I, I have a friend who he makes all these goat milk products and he makes a beard bomb and I want to start my own beard bomb business, beard oil business. So I would pay him a fee and I would able to take his product and he would slap the label on it and then I would sell it. Is that how that kind of works? Uh, so that, I mean, everyone mixes up the terminology that I consider like white labeling. This is literally when you're just taking yeah. someone else's product, you're putting your own label on it and then you're selling it, um, which happens all the time. Actually, if you mm -hmm. look in like the tech industry, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, like those USB sticks, you might yeah. see like an IBM branded one, um, right. you know, different companies. It's all the same stick, same manufacturer that all they're doing is putting their brand on it. Really uh, mm. that you can certainly do it that way. I think the best way, though, is if you actually make your own improvements to the product and then make it your own so that no one else is exact selling the exact same product. And I know that sounds intimidating, but it's actually not that bad. And you don't really need any design experience as long as you're working with the right factory. Well, can, can so, you kind of share how you did that? Yeah. So handkerchiefs really is just fundamentally a piece of fabric, right? Mm -hmm. So when we make our designs, we just work with the factory and sometimes we'll literally just take like a pencil drawn mock-up and show it to them. And they'll like sketch, they, they have artists in house and they'll sketch something out and we'll just kind of go back and forth to modify it. Sometimes we'll just even take an mm. image and have them just kind of recreate it to some embroidered design. Uh, so everything that we sell is embroidered. And mm -hmm. when you go through that process, and this is kind of just unique to what we do, you have to basically convert an image to separate colors like maybe like yeah. five colors for the for the stitching out mm -hmm. and then you just kind of go back and forth like you don't I, obviously i don't know anything well i know about handkerchiefs now but at the time <laughs> right, I didn't know right. anything about <laughs> right. it. And it's just something you learn and you don't really have to know exactly how it's done you just have to have the vision for how you want the product to look in the end so would another example be so like pat flynn has that switch pod i mean and yeah. tripods have been out before I mean, they, you know, right. people, they've been out forever, so, but he created this really quick opening, you know, really thing for doing selfies and all that sort of stuff. So is that what you're kind of talking about? Is that kind of another example where he's I taking think it? his example is a little bit more involved because okay. it literally involves designing something from complete scratch. Okay. Right. So w with his, I would imagine for doing something like Pat, I would imagine it would cost at least $25,000 to get started with something like that. Okay. Uh, what I was suggesting, which is what I guide most of my students to do, is just to take something that's already out there. Uh, I'll give a simple example. Let's say you want to design like a bag, right? Moving around pockets or changing the round design of a bag is very simple, right? Because it's a textile mm -hmm. product. And let's say you want to make, um, there's this example that I just gave the other day when I was giving a presentation. For some reason, weighted hula hoops are really big right now. Mm. And... <laughs> 
because we all One need to the, lose that weight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> really COVID twenty. Yeah. Some, yeah. Some <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Uh, one of the biggest complaints of these weighted hula hoops is that they're weighted so they like hurt your hips, right? So if you wanted to make mm -hmm. a change to make that product better, for example, you could literally just tell the manufacturer to add more padding around it. It would cost you more, but if you add more foam padding, that would make it a better product than what's already out there, right? And that wouldn't require any design expertise. Gotcha. So, oh, so interesting. So now I got to go get a weighted hula hoop for my collection. Yeah. Um, so Karen asked this question. She goes, is print on demand a good business model, model to try? And I know you've talked about this like in your podcast, like a lot of t-shirt sellers out there hawking different things and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I can speak from this from experience because my nine and 11 year old kids at the time, they started their own print on demand business for, for zero dollars. And they ended up making almost $1,000 in their first month of business just through social. So wow. print on demand is viable. What the problem with, so if you're very creative and you can come up with really good designs that appeal to a very specific niche, you can make that work. I would, and, and, and you can do it for free because the way print on demand work, it's a form of drop shipping mm -hmm. where you take the order and then that order goes to the print manufacturer and then they ship it to the end customer. I think you can make it work. What's difficult about that is that there's just rampant piracy going on right. in that space. Mm -hmm. So you might have a really good design, but then someone will copy it and then make like this slight adjustment to it so that it doesn't violate the copyright. So if in order to make that sort of business work, you have to be constantly putting out designs. Yeah. I got into that for a while. I have a Shopify store that I still sell stuff, but that's true. I mean, it's, it's very cool that now you can do that. I mean, like you can, set up a site with uh, Shopify and just like, I can make my own stuff anytime I want and have people buy it. So it's very cool. And it's great for like creators. You see a lot of YouTubers who have, you know, things at the bottom, their, their merch that they sell. And a lot of that is print on demand. So that's very, very interesting. So, I mean, I have a student in my class. She makes seven figures. Her man's a man. Her name is Amanda. She's a designer. She makes her own cards and she's just so prolific that it's impossible for anyone to knock her off. Like as soon as someone knocks her off, it doesn't matter because She's churning out so many designs every single month, and she, and it's great. Yeah, awesome. So her labor is in her creativity, and not the actual product fulfillment. So uh, Trona says this is fa so. I'm very. I'm. I know. I have so many questions, Trona. Yeah, you're exactly right. But Jacqueline has this. She goes. So when you alter a product uh, like your handkerchiefs, do you need to file a trademark for each design that you develop? No, so the trademark is actually only for your brand name. So we actually have a trademark for mm -hmm. Bumblebee Linens. Mm -hmm. And in terms of our designs, uh, what you can do is you can like register a copyright for those designs. And that's actually pretty inexpensive. It's like a couple hundred bucks to do that. Uh, we actually don't go that route because for us, it's all about brand. I mean, what we uh, in reality, actually, everything in the world is a commodity, right? Right. Chances are, if you're selling something, someone mm -hmm. else has sold it before. So it really just depends on your brand. And we've been doing this for a while now, and we have pretty good relationships with our customers so that even if they saw a knockoff, they would still buy from us because they we're, we're handkerchief specialists, right? They mm -hmm. bought from us before, they know the quality, and we can guarantee that quality. And that's why people come to us, even though there's probably hundreds of other sellers of handkerchiefs at this point. Mm, yeah. And, and I think from what you said before, it could probably become a full time job to pursue those copyright violations. So it might be right. better just to keep creating. Yeah. I mean, yeah. once you've established a good name for yourself, then just knockoffs becomes less of a factor in general. So this is a good question, too, from uh, Michelle. She uh, says hello from Ireland. Hello back. Um, I'm looking at your products and I can't see any labeling of or a logo. Is this a design decision? And I think a lot of people think the same thing. It's like when you create a product, you've got to somehow put your logo on it or somebody is going to knock it off. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So the because we sell handkerchiefs, like we're not going to like stitch in our logo to it, right? Mm -hmm. Although our aprons, we actually have like tags with our, with our logos on it. But for something like a handkerchief in a wedding, uh, someone's not going to want like the logo on it, they're going to want their own, you know, stitching and their own design on it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have our logo on it, but I would say the logo is more important for the packaging okay. and it depends on the product, right? Like if you're selling bags, obviously you should put your brand on it somewhere, but our, our items are pretty small. And I think our logo, especially for the handkerchiefs, would just take up too much space on the Got actual it. item. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Makes sense. Okay. I noticed we have some questions about getting started. Let's, Let's get yeah. into that. 
what what are the must haves to getting started? Like the bare bones must have in order to succeed. So the model that I actually recommend now is a little bit different than if you started like a decade ago. I think these days, Amazon has 50% of e-commerce and your mm -hmm. ultimate goal should be to have your own brand, which is very difficult to do on Amazon. So what I usually, the way I teach it is start, come up with an item to sell, start trying to sell it on Amazon first. And then once it has traction, start your own website and your own brand. So in terms of getting started, first thing you need to do, obviously, is you need to figure out what you want to sell, right? And in the event that you are not a creative person, like I don't consider myself a creative person from a product perspective, there's actually a whole bunch of tools out there that will allow you to just kind of browse Amazon and know exactly how much money that particular item is making in a given month. For example, like a tool like Jungle Scout, literally it's, it's a Chrome plugin. And as you're browsing on Amazon, you can click a button and it'll tell you how many units that sold in the last 30 days. Mm. So you can do your product research that way. There's also keyword tools out there that will tell you which exact products are being browsed or searched for, the exact search terms that they're typing in, the search volume, and how difficult it is to rank for that keyword. And so with that, hopefully you can find something that you can sell where you could add some sort of value to, right? We, we talked about that weighted hula hoop example where you're improving upon an item. So once you have that item, uh, you need to find a manufacturer. And I, I often get asked this question, like, can I get things manufactured in the United States versus Asia? The reason why people get stuff manufactured over in Asia is because the cost of labor is significantly lower. Let me give you an example. So for our handkerchiefs, right? The cost of the cotton is actually going to be the same whether I buy in the US or whether I buy it in China. But the fabric needs to be cut and sometimes it needs to be hemmed and that sort of thing. That labor cost is very expensive in the US versus China. So uh, just a typical handkerchief might cost me $4 in the US, but it might only cost me 25 cents or 50 cents in China. And this is why a lot of people go over there. Anything that involves any amount of labor is generally going to be less expensive to, to source over there. So hmm. on that, when we talk about like you're setting up that kind of supply um, um, pipeline. So are there some tips to do that? Because I know like even recently we had that blockage in the canal where yep. things couldn't go through and people were like ports were stacking up. I mean, is there a ways to protect yourself from those kind of things? I mean, do you hold so much inventory locally versus, I mean, how do you balance all that? I guess. Yeah. So it takes some time to get this right. But over time, you'll understand what your sales rate is and how much inventory that you should stock. So we try to hold no more than three months or so, because when you have to hold extra inventory, obviously that, that requires more warehouse space. Mm -hmm. And again, it takes some time to understand what your sales velocity is going to be. But things like the Suez Canal getting blocked is uh, hopefully an anomaly. <laughs> right, exactly. uh, yeah. Or COVID. Yeah. 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 Or, or COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we did get affected by the supply chain, but so, so some of our shipments were like three weeks late. One thing you have to realize is that when you source from overseas, there's going to be a lead time, right? So our lead time is typically actually three months, mm -hmm. typically it takes them a couple months to make the product. And then we budget usually like a month for it to come over by boat and clear customs. Gotcha. That's really important yeah. to, to know. So you can't really have... So you have to plan for the holidays or your really heavy Correct. seasons and for like weddings yeah. and stuff way in advance. That's what you're saying. So again, this is only for the private label model. Like for for drop shipping, it's there's less planning involved because you're not really in control of that. But yes, mm -hmm. if you want to make the most margin, so let me just give you an idea what the margins are. For drop shipping, the margins are between ten and thirty percent. But for private label, margins are typically at least sixty six percent, sometimes in the nineties. Like that handkerchief example <laughs> I gave you where we're spending like 25 to 50 cents on a handkerchief. Sometimes we can sell that handkerchief for $25 wow. if it's personalized, right? For a wedding. And it's, it's, it's partially due to the industry that we're in where, you know, people in, in weddings and, and special occasions, they're, they're less price sensitive. So true. Wow. So you mentioned you have like having a certain amount of inventory in a warehouse. Was there a time when your spare bedroom and your, 
and your garage were yeah. full of handkerchiefs. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, we we started out in our garage, um, <laughs> and it was it was actually quite hilarious because we'd have we bought industrial racks for our garage, and we left this like tiny hallway where you had to like kind of <laughs> slither around uh, in the beginning. You know, if you don't live in California, like we, if we didn't live in California, we probably would have moved it out of our garage much sooner, mm -hmm. but it's just real estate here is just so expensive. Right. Uh, but these days, actually, back when we started, we didn't have opportunities like this, but now these days there's three PLs, which stands for third party logistics firms, where you just send them the inventory and they do the shipping for you. Ooh. And then there's also Amazon FBA where you can send all your products to Amazon and they'll fulfill it for you. Even if you're selling on your own store. So for example, if I have a Shopify store and I get an order, I can literally have the, the, my shop automatically send a signal to Amazon to ship that item to the end customer as well. I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. So do you lose out a lot on margin when you do that? So Amazon probably will charge, and again, it just depends on how much your item costs, but you'll probably mm -hmm. lose like a maybe 10 to 15% off your top line. Okay. Um, the only downside really is not the money so much as when you use Amazon's fulfillment, it actually arrives in an Amazon branded box. Oh, I see. Whereas if you use your own 3PL, uh, they'll insert like whatever box you want, whatever inserts that you want. So that's like the advantage of going with 3PL right. over Amazon. Yeah. So okay. le Interesting. let's talk about marketing a little bit. Cause I know, you know, I'm sure that when you first started your marketing has changed from where it is now. Um, but Gianni, I even asked, uh, this is great. Also, you're going to talk about putting items on Pinterest. So do, do you use all the socials with, with your marketing? I mean, do you have like a whole like part of division of your company that you do or just have your e-commerce store or how do you let people know about your product? Yeah. So I have a couple of fundamental principles because we, we like to run things very lean. And so what we had focused on is uh, mainly search and paid advertising. Now, when it comes to e-commerce, really all you need is one good channel to hit six figures, and you probably need mm. two or three channels to hit seven figures. So our first channel was actually uh, Google AdWords, and we did really well with that. That actually got us pretty close to six figures by itself. And then we had a content strategy, which, which involves Pinterest and SEO, where we were putting out craft projects that brides would actually want to read, or basically uh, content that our target customers would want to read. We get their emails. Email marketing is huge also. And then our third prong was you would think that there wouldn't be that much repeat business in the wedding industry. Right. But it turns out that when we started selling, a lot of people were buying like 50 handkerchiefs, which seemed weird to me. Right. right? Uh huh. So one day we actually got up on the phone and called one of these customers and said, hey, uh, we noticed you ordered a large amount. Uh, can we give you like a dedicated rep and and a coupon code if you order again. And then we found out that all these event planners were ordering from us. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm. So now, whenever we get a large order, repeat business is the most important aspect of having your own store, by the way. Yeah. So now when we get a large order, we reach out to them and we say, hey, here's a dedicated point of contact. If you need anything, just call us up. We'll give you a discount and we'll make sure that it gets there on time because it's an event and it's very important. Mm. So that's that our three-prong attack. So we run... Email marketing represents 30% of our sales. Like repeat business is actually 36% of our sales, even though only 12% of our customers are repeat customers. Wow. Um, so in, in terms of traffic, we run Facebook ads, Google ads. Uh, we also do a lot of, we get a lot of traffic from SEO. And uh, in terms of getting people back to our site, we are doing Facebook Messenger, email, and SMS. SMS or text message mm -hmm. marketing is probably the thing of the future. Right. I don't know if you guys are used to yeah. getting yeah. texts from stores now, but people are used mm -hmm. to it and it actually does really well. So on, so how do your emails work? Cause I'm just trying to think of like, how do yeah. I get a handkerchief email? It just, I mean, how often do you send those? I mean, it just seems, it just seems yeah. different to me. So I, I'm really interested in that. Cause that would be, think of a hard get people open that or something. I'll, I'll walk you through the process. So, the way we get emails primarily right now is this pop-up on our site and it's a wheel of fortune pop-up. Mm -hmm. So in return for an email address, you get a chance to spin the wheel to get free stuff. And who doesn't like free stuff, right? right. So free they give stuff. us an email address and they spin the wheel 
And every, every spot on the wheel is a winner, whether it be a coupon code or like a free handkerchief or, or whatnot. All right. And then we make them redeem that offer via text message. So for example, let's say you win like a 20% mm -hmm. coupon. In order to get the coupon code, you have to text. Uh, we use what is called a two tap. This is where you click a link and then the text, the text uh, message app automatically opens and you just hit send. And then you get sent the coupon code and then you make a purchase. So in the event that they don't make a purchase, the email sequence, it's actually pretty long at this point. It's, it's probably like three months worth of emails. Um, we email them in the beginning, we email them more frequently, maybe like every other day or every third mm -hmm. day. And what we're doing there is we're not talking about handkerchiefs, right? We're mm -hmm. humanizing our company. Essentially. We're talking about our brand story. Uh, we're talking about what we sell, what are all of our value propositions? Like we're the largest, uh, purveyor of handkerchiefs on the internet. We can do personalization. And then we just talk about different products that we sell. And then we tell funny stories. Like, uh, we taught our wedding story. Um, here's a funny story that actually resonates with people for some one time when, like when my wife and I, we were dating, uh, I, I made her a really nice dinner, but I used these cheap paper napkins and my wife, like everything was perfect except for the napkins. Right. And then we talk about our line of monogrammed linen napkins and how that can add a lot to the wedding, uh, to the special occasion. And now uh, she we married you anyway. About, mm -hmm. Yeah, she married me anyway. <laughs> we talk about different crafts that you can make with handkerchiefs. So one that's really popular is this hanky bonnet. And I didn't know these were things until later on. But it turns out like you can make a bonnet out of handkerchiefs that that you use for your baby. And then you use that exact same handkerchief when you get married as your something blue, like little oh, things like that. Oh, That's yeah. really cool. So the goal of email marketing isn't necessarily get to sale right away, but it's just because people might not be ready to buy right away. But the idea is you want to keep them in your mind share over time so that when they are ready, they think about your store. Yeah, Trona says she's she's signing up just to see your sequence. So, <laughs> so maybe you get some more emails out of the show. Yeah, so yeah. that's really yeah. cool. So uh, the magical part, though, is the post-purchase sequence. Oh yeah, this is all automated. Depending on what you buy, you will get cross-sold different items. So uh, let me give you yeah. an example. So we sell cocktail napkins, lunch napkins, and dinner napkins in our shop, right? So let's say you buy just cocktail napkins. Well, our system will detect that. And they'll try to sell you matching lunch napkins and dinner napkins. And remember what I said, like the key to running your own online store is the, the key advantage is having repeat business and access to your customer base. When you sell on Amazon, mm -hmm. you don't have access to any of those things. And so what's cool about you, you can set up these automated systems that kind of generate sales on autopilot and someone who's bought from you before is much more likely to buy from you again. So you can literally just feast upon the people who've already purchased from you. Mm, super smart. So is the, My mind is the melting. three month? I know, I know so much here. Um, the three month sequence is is that kind of based on why did you decide three months? I'm sure there's some. Uh, it's, it didn't it. start out as three months. It really just started mm -hmm. out as what I can feel like writing. Like my brain goes different when I write about <laughs> yeah. it. Okay. So it's just something you add over time, right? You might start out with only three emails and then you just add to it over time. And one thing, one thing I forgot to mention actually about that pre purchase sequence is. Every five or so emails, we'll send out a coupon code. And because oh. the goal of that pre purchase sequence is literally just to get a sale, no matter how much, right? Yeah. So we'll intersperse these coupon codes. But if they make a purchase in between that, like before they get the coupon code, they actually mm -hmm. won't get the coupon code anymore. Right? Uh -huh. So everything there is designed just to get that first purchase because the magic really happens once you actually have them as a customer and you can cross sell them different items in the store. Awesome. We have some great questions. We have our yeah. audience is some of the smartest people around there. But um, uh, Trona asked this. She goes, "Are you using AI for those matching items? Like when somebody picks it?" It's not AI. It's just all based on data. So um, I'll just give you an example. Something really simple. So so the napkin example I already gave you. But here's a different one. Let's say someone buys a particular style of handkerchief, but whenever they buy that handkerchief, we have data that says that this other handkerchief is commonly bought with it. Then mm -hmm. we'll try to cross sell that. And if we don't have that data based on what someone bought, we just simply cross sell categories. So for example, yeah. let's say someone purchased a color embroidered handkerchief, like one of the pre embroidered ones, we might try to cross sell them personalized ones where they can write whatever message they want. It's just as an example, mm -hmm. you're selling them more of the same because we have a lot of SKUs. 
And when you're shopping, this happens to me all the time. I might not even know about different categories of products that the store has to offer because I was laser focused on getting that one particular thing that I was looking for. That's, that's very, and we have another great one from Rocky about uh, that game base wheel that you're talking about. He says, does that, does using a game base form like that lead to a lot of fake emails? Uh, do you check your open uh, rate on that? Uh, so it can maybe depending on what you sell, but it's, it's mostly coupons, right? So right. no one's going to really want a coupon code unless they have the intention of actually buying from you. And in terms of the conversion rate, I actually had data. Uh, so before my lead manual was just a coupon code flip right out the bat. And I think that converted at like 1.5 or 1.4%. And then I switched that over to a different pop-up where we were giving out like a book of crafts or a napkin folding book, depending on what mm -hmm. type of product they were looking at. So it was like a, a content specific or product specific lead value. And that improved it to like 2%. And then when I went to the spin to win, it jumped up to like 3.6% opt-in. Mm. Oh, wow. So the gamification aspect oh. of it really actually adds something to it because people love to gamble, I guess, or, right. or <laughs> yeah, be they surprised. Do. Yeah. Are yeah. you always testing yes. things all the time? I mean, I mean yes. are you always uh, run tests? I'm an electrical engineer at heart. So, <laughs> there you go. Uh, mm -hmm. like, you I, can't I, help I, it. I rely on numbers. Yeah, I can't help it. Yeah, I rely on numbers <laughs> and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. All okay. right. Okay. So, if you're just starting out and maybe you have one or two products, is there anything that you need to do to protect yourself legally? Legally? Well, what are we yeah. selling here? <laughs> um, <laughs> No, Animals, I mean, what if are you I'm doing? selling soap, <laughs> um, like, do I need to have business insurance? Um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, when you're first starting out, I would probably just get limited liability. Okay. And once your business gets big and you have something to protect, then you can get liability insurance. And again, it really just totally depends on what you sell. Like for us, like handkerchiefs, chances are, I know the U.S. is very litigious, but chances are people aren't going to hurt themselves on like a handkerchief. Right. Oh, so you say we that now. Actually, like, yeah, right. <laughs> So we put off that whole process of getting the liability insurance until a little bit later, once mm -hmm. we already okay. had established something. But if you're selling like consumables and, and that sort of thing, maybe I might be a little bit more careful. Yeah. yeah you're going to have to start sense. putting like yeah. like disclaimers on your handkerchiefs. Like these are too soft. Like the McDonald's are, <laughs> yeah, this danger. coffee may be hot. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> McDonald's. Um, yeah. So th it's really interesting to me because I think when I've, I've heard you in the past, you were kind of like not as pro Amazon as you are now. And it's, it seems like you may have changed a little bit. My question is, is I've heard so many people that have gotten, I'm trying to say this nicely, not had good experience with Amazon. They've lost their entire store or they've started Amazon and they're getting like 90% of their sales from Amazon and 10% from their own site, or maybe not even that much. Yeah. And it feels yeah. like, and they are in fear of Amazon. Like, I could lose this in a day. Right. So what are your thoughts on that? Because it, it, it does sound a little scary that they have that much power. They do. And in general, like I, you can't really ignore Amazon. So I'm not pro Amazon per se, but I'm pro sales. Right. right. <laughs> and what you'll find that some people just only shop on Amazon and some people like to shop on boutiques and you really have to cater to both of them. Right. So for those people who are getting most of their sales on Amazon, chances are they're spending most of their time working on Amazon and not their own shop, right? Whatever you tend to work on is what will tend to improve. And let me just, I've been teaching this class for a very long time. Mm -hmm. The top mistakes that I see from people with their own stores, number one, is that it's not trustworthy. So you have to, you have to make your store, you have to make your site trustworthy. You have to emphasize like that you have no hassle returns, fast shipping. You have to have contact information. And the store has to be laid out in a way like there's testimonials, press mentions, whatever, to make it feel like it's in sh like it's shopped in. It has to have social proof and it has yeah. to be designed. Th there's a whole bunch to it, right? There's even like the call to actions on the site, your value props. They all have to be there because on your own site, no one trusts you right off the bat like they trust mm -hmm. Amazon. So number one, most people, the design isn't even good. And then second of all, they don't have a way to retain their customers, right? The... The average conversion rate for an e-commerce store is something like 2%, which basically means 98% of the people are not going to buy from you. And so you have to have bare minimum email to get people back. A lot of people don't do that. Also, a lot of people don't focus on the repeat business. Uh, I mentioned like that post-purchase sequence. Stuff like that is kind of like par mm -hmm. for the course. Mm -hmm. 
a, a way to get people to buy more, maybe like have a loyalty program. And only then, once you have all those things in place, should you even be thinking about driving traffic. What I find is that new people, they'll throw up a site, they're so excited, they'll spend money on advertising, not get as many sales or repeat sales or anything, and then they give up. And then they go, okay, Amazon's working here because Amazon does most of the work and gives right. you most of the sales. I may as well focus more of my time there. Gotcha. Mm. On the Amazon front, can you even charge for shipping anymore? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's like free shipping is kind of like everybody's expecting that. Can you, I mean, if you, if you get, you can. Started, okay. Okay. Talk about this that is what me. you should do. Like when you have your own online store, what you want to do is you want to have a sh free shipping threshold, right? Mm. Yeah. And Amazon actually has this if you're not prime, right? Right. If you're not a prime mm -hmm. member, they, I don't remember what their shipping threshold is, but it's fine. And what's cool is once you have this shipping threshold, you'll find that people will start adding an extra item just to hit that threshold. <laughs> I do that. So right. let's I say do. you want to try to increase your average order value. You can play around with that amount to, to boost yeah. your sales. Mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, a I'm a sucker for that. I do that all the time. <laughs> like yeah. I'll buy another shoe. Yeah. I'll do some much more shoes. <laughs> I do, yeah, I, I do, do that, that math do in my right. head. I'm like, okay, that would be like getting this item for only $4, even though it's 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a, yeah. yeah. So yeah. a question, it sounds like you have everything really well set up and really well, like highly automated um, in a good way. Um, it, can everyone do that from the start? Or is that the kind of thing you have to kind of work up to, to be able to afford? You, you work up to it. I, I would say right. like bare minimum, if you were to just start out. Get your website and your value props and all that stuff in order, and then just do email mm -hmm. in the very beginning. I'm in kind of like a different situation. Uh, since I teach a class on this, I treat my store kind of like a laboratory. Mm -hmm. So anything oh, new fine. that comes out, I'll immediately implement it, right? And I'll usually document all the results on the blog. Um, and usually, it I, I usually devote my like at least a year for everything. So last year mm -hmm. was the year of SMS. The prior year was the year of Facebook Messenger, and then you know so on and so forth. Okay. I like wow. it. Wow. So what's it what's year. this year? Yeah. Uh, this year is actually social. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, fun. Yeah. So you know but, all the good tools, right? Uh, I know which ones are good, and I have all the tools because uh, just by nature of running my blog, every service provider just gives them to me, and yeah. I'll try them, right? And right. I'll kind of use what I like the best. So what, products. just for an example, because I get this question a lot, what SMS tool do you like to use the most? I'm using postscript.io. Uh, what I like about them is that they are very specifically tailored towards e-commerce and they're very inexpensive. So what, uh, for most of you guys who are used to email, you typically pay by the number of subscribers that you right. have. But for, with postscript, what's nice is you only pay for what you send. You don't get charged for how many subs that you have. And I find that pricing oh. model very refreshing. Mm, that's really cool. That's so nice. as an e-commerce store owner, what scares you the most or keeps you up most at night? I mean, you've been doing this for a while and I know you've put in measures to keep things, but I know like if I started a store, I'd be worried about Amazon, you know, that would keep yeah. me up. What, what, what worries you the most about e-com like today? So what I would say is like, if you're all in on Amazon, I would be very afraid. Um, mainly because okay, I'll just tell you what's happening to us recently. Uh, we're on Amazon and we obviously we make both, we make the bulk of our revenue from our store. So I'm a little bit less worried about this, mm -hmm. but we've gotten people that just purposely buy our stuff and mark it as defective. And occasionally we'll wake up with our listing suspended. And wow. that's really stressful if all of your income is dependent on that. Right. Right. Wow. Well, yeah. Um, the reason why we can sleep at night is because we have such a solid repeat customer base for our store today. Uh, as I mentioned before, 36% of our revenues every mm -hmm. single year are kind of in the bank, right, for repeat right. business. And so that just gives us peace of mind right there. And then the fact that we're in control of our own traffic generation and that sort of thing makes me a lot more comfortable. If my business were entirely Amazon, to be honest, maybe I might be generating more revenue. It's possible if I, because mm -hmm. we only have actually like 10 or 15% of our products on Amazon for that reason. Any sort of suspension or anything negative, like we've been attacked many times by people also right. on Amazon. Anytime something bad happens, it like literally ruins my wife's entire day. Right, right. And uh, mm -hmm. she's it's in a bad it. mood and that puts me in a bad mood and then no one's in a good mood. <laughs> That's right. 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 
<laughs> so you have to weigh in your mind how important peace of mind is. Like if you go all in on Amazon in the very beginning when you're first starting out, it can be very attractive because Amazon has that large audience that can drive you the traffic. But at some point, something bad's going to happen to you. Whether someone just purposely leaves negative reviews on you, someone just knocks off your product, or someone tries to get mm -hmm. you suspended. And when that happens, oftentimes it, it takes something like that happening for you to realize that, oh, maybe I should be working more on my own brand and my own online store. Is that how a lot of students come to you? Like they've tried it one way and it didn't work? Well, what ends up happening is I always teach them to start out on Amazon to validate their product because you don't want someone buying yeah. a whole bunch of product not knowing it's going to sell, right? Right. But what ends up happening is they make so many sales on Amazon that it's like a drug. Right. Imagine if you've uh -huh. never sold Me before more, and all yeah. of a sudden you're making like I've had students make six figures within like a couple of months after launching on wow. Amazon. And they're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And then they say, why should I even bother working on my store? Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's a lot more work to get the store mm -hmm. correct. There's a lot more moving pieces there. Right. And then they get their product suspended. And they're like, OK, OK, now I understand. <laughs> okay, Steve, you were right. Yeah. <laughs> because getting your product back from a suspension yeah. can take weeks. Right. Sometimes oh, even months, man. depending on the severity, right? And, can, and if you can imagine, Amazon's holding your money at that point, too. Mm -hmm. And they're not paying you out when you're suspended. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, can we talk about tools a little bit? Yeah. Like absolutely. Good tools for beginners. So we're not, we're probably not going to have Steve set up with all the pre sales and after sales sequence. Maybe we are. What's what's the, kind of the best stack of tools for a brand new e-commerce seller? Yeah, so bare minimum, I think you probably need a good shopping cart. Uh, the ones that I like are, I'll, I'll go in order of price. Shift for Shop is actually a relatively new entrance. They offer their entire shopping cart for free, and it's as power. It's more powerful than Shopify. Wow! And the reason they are able to offer for free. It's because Shift4 is fundamentally a credit card processing company, and they make their money off of the credit card processing. So you have to use their credit card processing, which is also free. And if you use that, the cart is free. Okay, the Whoa. second next in terms of being powerful is WooCommerce. That's like the mm -hmm. a very inexpensive option. That's a plugin for Word for WordPress. If you guys are already mm -hmm. using WordPress, I imagine most of your audience is probably on WordPress, right? Mm -hmm. Or a lot of them are. I imagine so too. Yeah. And then after that is big commerce. And then Shopify is probably the most popular one that people always talk about it, but it's also the most expensive one over time as well. Yeah. Is that okay. because it's easier for people to get set up with, or is it just because people know it? Uh, people so it? <laughs> it's popular. A lot of people, there's a lot of developers for it. It's really easy to find help. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of tutorials on it, but what they get you at is the shopping cart at a base level doesn't do very much. Right. So you end up having to pay for plugins that mm. have monthly recurring fees. Right. Got it. So outside of your shopping cart, all you pretty much need is Klaviyo, which is my email marketing platform that I always recommend just to everyone. It's a no brainer that will do all the sequences, uh, like the abandoned Ooh. cart, the pre-purchase, the post-purchase. It knows what everyone has purchased. So you can do very granular things like, like that example I gave you where if someone bought like a cocktail napkin, you can cross sell them a dinner napkin, for example. And that's something a brand new seller could af afford to It's get? free for up to 250 subscribers. And the idea okay, is, <laughs> is that the revenue per email is clearly given to you. And so you know how much money you're making off of email. And so that's why you can justify it. Once it starts bringing the money, oh. it's going to, once you exceed 250, it's going to cost you money, but you should be making more than what you're paying. Very cool. Wow. So those are some great free tools. So I can see everyone's writing them down, scribbling oh furiously. Yes. So I want to, I want to, before we go to, I know we're going to talk about like, we've kind of already talked about some common beginner mistakes, but I, I know that I've even had some friends that this has happened to is they just started a thing and they put their product out there and immediately it seemed like somebody had copied their product and, and put it on Amazon. So mm. how do you protect yourself from it seems like there's a there's almost like a epidemic of people like as soon as they see something and they'll try to beat the price or they'll you know make it a little bit cheaper and they'll get all the sales or how do you protect yourself from like rip off artists? Yeah, so are, are you referring to the case where they're literally just copying the exact same product and putting it on Amazon? Yeah, I've, I've seen some people like they've they've actually almost gone to the same factory at 
where they were getting it produced and they kind of they made a slight little you know modification to kind of get by maybe um because most people can't fight it in court but and and they take it and they actually put it a couple dollars or a little bit cheaper and they start getting all the sales and that one kind of goes away yeah i mean fundamentally speaking that's one of the problems of selling on amazon Mm -hmm. right because there's no brand most people will buy just based on the number of reviews or like the amazon tags that are given there right um so i would say like if you want to protect yourself let's say a factory starts selling the products you're selling that you've modified and made your own Mm -hmm. to somebody else if you register the copyright for that you can go up to amazon and say hey i own the copyright for this and that amazon will usually just take them down right right Mm -hmm. um if you need some like a further level of enforcement you could actually file for a chinese copyright like i actually have a lawyer that i work with in the class mm-hmm. who does sort of things like this where you can actually work with the chinese government to try to shut down the copycats at the source as well wow. i wouldn't go this route until uh, unless you're really worried about that happening um, the goal here is to establish a brand and there's always going to be knockoffs for everything in life right mm-hmm. If you like walk into Costco, you'll notice that there's Kirkland branded stuff all over the place, right? <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. I went to the drugstore the other day to buy Allegra, and then there was Wallegra at Walgreens, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you take the time, and this always takes time to establish a brand, but once you have that brand, people will tend to stick with you, you know, once you have that name share, and that's really hard to do on Amazon, which is why I always recommend people start their own sites. Yeah. Uh, can you can you give us a little insight into how you started to do that? I think you mentioned like packaging might be important like, and maybe your email sequences, but like how does a person start to build a brand from nothing? Yeah, I mean it's just like uh, it's it's building an audience really is is what it is. So it's through content, it's through email, it can be through social media. Um just all these little things over time. Word of mouth is actually really huge too. So if you make a customer happy, They'll tell their friends. So here's here's one thing, that, another advantage of private label that I forgot to mention. So our customer service policy is that if someone complains about our product, we just let them keep it for free and we give them a full refund. Mm. And mm. we are able to do that because our margins are high. If your margins aren't high, you obviously can't do that. But word of mouth is really powerful because if someone's just really ecstatic about it, they'll tell their friends. Whereas if you piss someone off, right. they'll probably tell even more people Right. Yeah. Uh, so word of mouth is huge and never underestimate the power of legwork. So I mentioned earlier that we actually physically call up our biggest customers and establish relationships with them. That matters actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually a voice call is worth infinitely more than like an email. Right. And so it just takes time. I mean, like how do you become friends with somebody, right? In the beginning you meet and it's only through repeated exposure. Like I have a great, I have a great relationship with you guys because we've like worked together now for quite some time, right? Mm-hmm. And so let's say a Tailwind clone starts coming out. You think I'm going to use the Tailwind clone? I hope well, not, maybe Steve. if the price is right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Maybe if they give you a free, <laughs> free account. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So, so I guess what I'm hearing you say is that um, it takes, you know, it's that relationship that you you try to make it's almost things that you can't scale, but you have these tools that you make them kind of scale, like the, the calls and the, uh, the emails and telling funny stories and all that stuff. The, so let's say that somebody already has a great social follow. Let's say they're at least a Meredith and they have all these thousands of people following them on social. Does social itself translate? Like if Elisa said she's going to start a store and start selling, uh, I don't know. Um, what do you, uh, you know, her, her I'm personalized I'm just going to let you struggle food. with this. Cat food. Okay. Her, yeah, your yeah, own Be careful there, Jeff. Be careful. I know. <laughs> she, well, there will be a cat that will walk behind her in just a second. But um, <laughs> she's going to do that. Would that would social proof translate into sales or does that It equal? absolutely does. Okay. It absolutely does. And, in fact, you know, influencer marketing can be a big factor too. Uh, we worked with influencers in the past because uh, we sell these really cute mother-daughter aprons. And so – we were mm-hmm. actually working with uh, mommy bloggers at one point where we would just give them some aprons and they would just bake on their Facebook lives with them. And they say, <laughs> Hey, did you like our aprons? They're, they're matching and they're monogrammed go here to check them out. And we, we have an affiliate program and you know, both parties win, right? The yeah. more they sell, the more money they make. Oh, that's a great point. I didn't even think about affiliate marketing. On, on all well, this I was part. thinking about, you know, this morning I was 
thinking about Mark Schaefer, okay, a great friend of, of ours um, and a really great marketing mind and, and how many connections he has and the personal brand he has built for being just a really great guy with a huge heart. Well, he he now paints watercolor mm -hmm. um, on his in his free time. And I was thinking, you know what? <laughs> I bet if he wanted to, he could probably make a business selling watercolors just because people want a piece of someone they love, you know, in a nice way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it absolutely translates. Yeah. So we've got about yeah. five, I was going to say, we've got about five more minutes left, Elisa. So uh, I've got yeah. some questions to bring up from the people. I mean, we, I could nerd out on this stuff for the rest of the month with having Steve I back know. on because this is super myself. fascinating. Um, so somebody <laughs> asked Steve, um, where, this is Mindy, and she goes, what is Steve's course? Um, where can we find that at? So Yeah, it's over at uh, profitableonlinestore.com. Okay. Yep. There it is, ProfitableOnlineStore.com. You guys can go check that out. I'm sure you guys are um, super interested. This is just, I mean, it's fascinating. Um, so uh, we've got um, some, uh, yeah, so Jack Will says, <laughs> this guy is the best. This guy, yeah. Steve, is the best. So much this valuable guy, info. Steve. Yeah. I, I love the question, are these shows getting shorter? No, they're they're just that, so exciting. They're they, getting so much more exciting. <laughs> they go by so fast. <laughs> yes. Yes, and uh, so um, so um, I think we've covered it. What else have we missed, Elisa? I mean, I know okay. I've gone okay. through questions. I don't know how we can answer this one in the time we have left, but okay, this can be a, a challenge for Steve. The thing that I think frightens me the most or is most intimidating to me about all the things we've talked about is finding a supplier that you can trust. Mm. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> I have some advice on that. Um, again, it's it's just like building a relationship with anybody else. So the way we do it is we always just work our way up, right? You start out with a small order, and once you've established trust, you start you you then move up to a larger order, a large order. We actually like to take that extra step, and we'll like literally fly to China to visit our vendors, mm. oh, and wow. usually yeah. they'll take us out, and we'll spend some time with them. Sometimes it's awkward, but, uh, <laughs> but just the act of socializing with them actually makes them give, Hey, I'll, I'll tell you a really good example, a really good okay. story about this. Uh, so one time we were working with this vendor and we were like negotiating on costs to get them lower. And then they agreed to our price and then they shipped us product where the fabric was like paper thin because they, mm. they kind of, you know, cut corners and we didn't, we weren't really specific enough and we, we got, uh, but we really liked them and they were the only vendor that actually produced that particular item that we wanted to sell or that particular style. So we wanted to stick with them. And so when we attended the Canton Fair, which is this annual fair in China, we actually took some time to visit them at their office. And for some reason, like we spent like almost a day together where we kind of had a meal mm. and we just hung out. And for some reason, after we got back to the States, we got the same price. And all of a sudden, we never had a quality problem ever again. Oh, that's oh wow. Cool. Yeah. And I, I think it, I, I don't know for sure, but I think it has to do with the fact that we already had this relationship. And today, there's still one of our vendors like almost a decade later. And here's the thing. Other people have reached out to them to try to knock off our products, and they won't sell it to them. And they let us know. Oh, that's amazing. Also. Yeah. So it's just time, really. So Mark asked this question in mm -hmm. follow-up, and I, I think this will probably be our last one. Do I need an intermediary when I get started with dealing with a factory in China? You do not, because everyone there has at least one person who speaks or can write the language. I'll tell you a funny story there. Mm -hmm. One time I went to the Canton Fair, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to use my Chinese. And I actually tried to speak Chinese to one of the vendors there. And they replied to me in English <laughs> because my Chinese was so bad. They were like, okay, I'm just going to. Yeah, gonna forget you. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So now whenever I go, I, I just speak in English with everyone. What's cool is like these messaging apps now, like I can just have them use WeChat and literally show me the product as it's being made on the factory floor also. Mm. Wow. Uh, it wasn't like this when I first got started 14 years ago, right? Right. Yeah. So much easier now. 
That is awesome. Thank Man, you. we have, this has gone by. I'm, we have to have Steve back because this is amazing. And this was very you. popular with everybody here. Like Thank you guys on yeah. for all your questions. I've been listening to his podcast uh, for years. You guys need to check it out. I've, I, like I said, I've snuck in and secretly uh, watched him at Social Media Marketing World when probably I was supposed to be doing real work. But uh, he's amazing. <laughs> if you have a chance to get it, to hear him speak, Go, I mean, go check out his course. Go, go to mywifequitherjob.com, and um, it's he's amazing, and you can tell he knows his stuff. So, make sure you guys do that, and don't forget. Yeah, and make our- sure you check out a profitable online store as well, because um, oh, yeah. we learned yeah. a lot today. But oh, there's a lot more to learn, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm going to pull that up one more time for you guys. So it's ProfitableOnlineStore.com. Go check out Steve's course if you're interested in uh, e-commerce and setting up your own uh, your own store. It's amazing. And don't forget also our awesome templates this uh, the, for April that are at TW Pinterest Toolkit. That's bit.ly forward slash TW Pinterest Toolkit. We'll check mm-hmm. that out. And also this course that Elisa actually did for Steve that you guys mm-hmm. now can have access to at bit.ly forward slash sales from Pinterest. Uh, go check that out and go through that. It'll be amazing. Elisa always does a great job. Don't tell her I said that. But... <laughs> Uh, we love you guys thank you guys so much for sharing <laughs> feel free to share this to your friends like oh my gosh my mind was melted from the steve guy you need to go check him out <laughs> share that out for for all your friends Amazing. we will see you guys this oh i'm gonna let lisa have the next uh, the i wondered word. if i, I was do. gonna get the last you word. always get the um, final word <laughs> uh so come back next week yes um because we have trona on trona who is on every single show has some cool stuff to talk about with Pinterest and Google SEO and how they work together. So tune in for that one as well. Yeah. And Steve, was, that was so fun. I feel so much smarter now and I want to go start thanks. a, a, I had a blast. business. Thank you. Bye everybody. <laughs> Bye.